Good morning, Fairlawn. It's good to be back with you today. For those of you whom I haven't had a chance to meet, um, my name is Matthew, as Brennan mentioned, and I pastor Pleasant Street Church down the hill. Um, and I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters down there. And it's good to be back amongst you today. I had a chance to spend a few days this week uh, with your pastor, Joel. We were in New Mexico together. Uh, thank you for letting me borrow him for a few days. Um, and in our time together, it was restful and I think also a good reminder for me of what a gift uh, he has been in my life, um, and I imagine in yours too. This morning, um, I understand you've been going through 2 Corinthians over the last little while together. I'm going to turn us to a moment in the Bible a little bit earlier in that conversation between Paul and the Corinthians from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you've ever read Paul before, you know that he has a way of weaving together a whole bunch of different themes right on top of each other. And so sometimes if you want to pull one of those out, you got to jump around a little bit. So I'm going to be reading from chapter 3. Um, I'll pick up our text in verse 19 with uh, what's on the slides, but I'm actually going to start in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, just to get us started in this conversation. So I'm going to start at 3, verse 1, and jump over uh, to verse 19 eventually. Friends, these are Paul's words. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. And then at verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. This, then, is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. 
When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. Friends, this is God's word. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, gathered here this morning, we ask that you would come in the power of your Holy Spirit, and you would take Paul's words written to the Corinthians, and that you would, by your Spirit, breathe and plant them in us, that they might be words for us too. Use them to grow us up into all the fullness and maturity that we see in your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in your name. Amen. Ten years ago, Mars Hill Church in Seattle seemed like a church that was too big to fail. It also seemed to a lot of us like the hope of what Christianity could look like in the midst of an increasingly hostile Western culture. You see, somehow Mars Hill Church was in the middle of Seattle, one of the, one of the most post-Christian and hostile cultures in the West, and it was thriving. In 2013, Mars Hill was drawing a weekly average attendance of 12,300 people across 15 campuses. In that same year, 2013, the, the church planted 53 new congregations in India. It released 50 new original worship songs online. It gave away more than 3,000 Bibles in the city of Seattle alone. And it took in nearly $25 million in tithes and offerings. And less than one year later, all of it was gone. What happened? Well, the lead pastor, church planter, and all-around rock star, Mark Driscoll, resigned. And two months after he resigned, the church closed its doors, all of them. It's without a doubt the case that Mark Driscoll and Mars Hill's success were intertwined together, and that Mars Hill's success was built around a cult of personality, uh, that of Mark Driscoll, or rather, we should probably say a persona that he designed and, and presented to the world, a, a persona of a leader who was brash and powerful and confident and, and in your face, who told it like it was, which was very refreshing, and he was uncompromising, and he was successful, and he was compelling. He was, the, he was presented to us as the man with the words and the vision and the stridency to convince all of us that what he believed could change our lives too. But the thing that they didn't tell us was that at the same time he was also a liar and he was domineering and narcissistic and self-aggrandizing. Christianity Today last year ran a 15-part podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Very important conversation. I'd encourage you to listen to it. In one of those episodes, the, the host, um, Mike Cosper, is interviewing one of the former senior leaders at Mars Hill, and they're talking about this moment in about 2013 when, when the church uh, is is experiencing unbelievable success and they're doing hundreds of baptisms and they're opening these campuses. And it's interesting because the interviewee in this moment says this. He says, we just kept winning. In fact, we were winning so much, we rented out the, Seahawk, the Seattle Seahawks football stadium for Easter and we packed it out. We just kept winning and Mark looked unstoppable. We just kept winning. What we needed was to lose we needed to fail. What? The Mars Hill story reveals an upside-down, inside-out, counterintuitive paradox of Christianity. In the Christian life, success and strength are very dangerous. 
Or as Paul put it to the Corinthians a long, long time ago, the foolishness of God is wisdom and the weakness of God is strength. Paul is saying to us today, my friends, don't mistake success for God's presence. Don't mistake strength for the power of God, for God shows up in weakness. This theme is, in many ways, right at the heart of what Paul is trying to get across over and over again to the Corinthians in his letters to them. And it's a theme 2,000 years later that we are still struggling to understand. You would think that it's obvious in some sense that it's Christianity 101, right? That uh, you follow Jesus and you don't follow someone else. Except that here in this part of the letter, Paul spends two whole chapters of precious papyrus paper going over a basic idea, an idea that he refers to as milk. An idea that he refers to as the very first thing that he ever said to them which is still what he is saying because all this time later they are still unspiritual. If you look at what's getting in the way of their growth into maturity as a congregation, Paul seems to be suggesting that, among other things, it's their success that's getting in the way. You know, in many ways, Corinth is a very successful church. In fact, if you looked at it across the metrics that we use for church growth today, you'd see that it ticks off all of our boxes as well. Uh, it's a church full of both Jews, Jews and Gentiles, so it's, it's multi-ethnic. Uh, it's got socioeconomic diversity in the midst of its congregation. Uh, they seem to have a a lot of really, really gifted and talented people involved in the life of their church in Corinth, and you've got a, a few uh, famous and prominent members of their community who go to their church as well, this guy named Gaius being one of them. And Corinth also has the distinct honor of being a congregation that's been graced by the who's who of Christian leadership in the first century. They have Paul and Apollos, and Peter himself in their stable of pastors. But Paul does not seem to be applauding them for any of this, does he? No, he seems to be saying, this is not a feature, my friends, it is a bug. So in, in Paul's letters, in all of them, you have two things that I want us to keep in mind for a second. On the one hand, you have the church. And on the other, you also have the wider surrounding culture in which the church lives. And in each letter that Paul writes, one of the issues that Paul addresses is how these two things are relating, how the church is relating in its surrounding culture. For instance, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes to Christians who are so very different from their surrounding culture that it's causing them great suffering. And so Paul writes to encourage them about the future and God's return. In 1 Corinthians, the problem doesn't seem to be that the church is so different from their wider culture. The problem is that it is the same. And this is causing great suffering. Corinth is the same as its wider culture in one very important way. The Corinthians seem to keep looking for self-glorifying leaders to give them purpose, meaning, and identity in their life. In chapter 4, verse 7, a verse I didn't read, Paul asks a very important question. He asks, who makes you different from anyone else? But you could also translate it like this. Who defines you? That's an identity question, if, if you're familiar with that. And it reveals some of what's going on in Corinth. Who defines you, Paul asks. And the answer is... Apollos does. Paul does. Peter does. They are allowing, even wanting, leaders in their church to define them. Why is this a problem? Well, if you go just one verse before that in chapter 4, verse 6, you'll see why it's a problem. It's making them all walk around puffed up, inflated, 
overinflated uh, about which important church leader person knows their name and who they follow and who knows them and it's making them competitive and self-righteous and intolerant. But it's why this is happening to them that's really important for us today. And to understand why, we have to walk back for a second to note some important things about what's happened in the city where they live. You know, something that we should know about this city of Corinth is that it was rebooted. There was a Greek city called Corinth. Now, you see, it so happened that they did not submit to Rome when Rome came along as the new global power on the scene. And so Rome did what they did when people refused to submit. They came along and they blew it up. They literally burned the entire city to the ground and they removed all of the people and it lay in ruins for about a hundred years. And then Rome decided in the next century after this that they're going to reboot the city. And so they rebooted it as a, as a Roman colony and they brought in their own loyal population and colonized it. And who did they bring? They brought slaves. And they bought former slaves imported from other regions of the empire. In other words, in Corinth, everyone there came from somewhere else. No one knew who they were. No one knew who they used to be. Can you imagine Whitensville rebooted? Can you imagine coming to this town from somewhere else and nobody knows you? Nobody knows your last name. Nobody knows your family story. Nobody carries memories of what you were like when you were five. What would a fresh start mean for people in this community? And you see, for, for ancient Corinth, it was even more so because in the ancient world, there are very few opportunities to change your career or your identity. So Corinth became a place where people could come for a fresh start, where people were looking for a new identity. And it was rich, so you had people coming from all over, and you had opportunities. You could start a business. You could choose new gods to worship. You could be somebody and this is what makes people open to Paul's gospel, people who are living anonymously in a big city, but it also is what makes them open to absolutely anyone with any idea or identity for sale. And Paul says that this is what you started to do with Apollos and Peter and me, and the result, church, is that you've forgotten who you are, and you've forgotten who we are which is what happens when leaders begin to matter too much. We call it idolatry. In Corinth, you have the church and you have the wider culture, and Paul is saying that the problem isn't that the church is so different from the wider culture. The problem is that it's the same in one particular way. They're picking and evaluating leaders based on how powerful, effective, attractive, successful they are, because those leaders could make you feel strong and successful, which is something that we all want. You know, it's ironic. We today have more resources and more words to talk about identity than I think maybe any culture has ever had before. And yet, have you noticed that our identities are so very fragile? We talk about identity all the time, and yet, isn't it funny that no one seems to know who they are? We seem to be looking for it everywhere and hungry all the time and never satisfied. Caitlin Beatty is a, a writer who lives in New York City. She used to be an editor at Christianity Today. Um, and she recently wrote a book called Celebrities for Jesus. And in that book, she writes about our modern fascination with celebrity. Uh, she says, living in New York and seeing celebrities, that, that when she sees a celebrity, there's this odd emotional response that she has. She feels excited. She finds herself drawn to them. She wants to be in their presence as if somehow by being around a famous person, she might absorb some of their glow she writes this, she says, there's a reason we call it celebrity worship. 
Our, our obsession with celebrities or trying to be celebrities ourselves betrays a spiritual hunger. Churches are emptier than they were, but the hunger for meaning and worth is as strong as ever. What humans of the past found in traditional worship and family and community, we now seek by consuming images of people we don't and can't know. Or, the charisma of a super confident leader makes you feel confident. And in our culture, Paul might add, the faith of a super confident church leader makes you feel confident. I think what Caitlin is trying to show us is that in the modern North American church, we are suffering not so much because we are different from this very different hostile culture, but in some ways we suffer because we are the same. And how many scandals, my friends, will it take for us to learn the cost of celebrity and platforms and self-glorification baptized as evangelism and church growth? You would think that it's obvious. It's Christianity 101. It's the basics, but apparently it's not. My friends, we follow strong leaders because we think they will lead us to strength. We do not want to follow weak people because we don't want to be weak. Have you ever looked at the job descriptions for leaders and pastors of churches in North America recently? Google them. And look at the verbs. Charisma, lead, cast vision, dynamic, confident, power, take hold, challenge, drive. It would seem, my friends, that you need not apply for leadership in the church today if you're not the loudest person in the room. Of course we need leadership, right? Of course. But, but those words, when I look at that, that's telling us something more. It's telling us what we believe leadership is. Do you see that? That, that belief is, has been shaped far too much by a culture of self-glorification, self-assertion, and personality. My friends, the leader teaches us the best life. But if we follow leaders who grasp at power and success and reputation and title, then we will become people who grasp at power and reputation and title. And it will make us arrogant, self-righteous, and competitive. And for both Christians and leaders, what's at stake, what's lost, is the truth of the gospel message, which is at the core of this letter and all of Paul's letters, which is that God works in weakness and foolishness and amongst the things that are not, which Paul says is the message I have been bringing to you all along. Barbara Brown Taylor uh, is a prominent mainline preacher and pastor, and many years ago she was interviewed by Christian Century, and the interviewer uh, in that conversation was asking Barbara Down Brown Taylor about the decline of mainline Christianity. Uh, and in the, interviewer, the, the, in the interview, the interviewer referenced how for several generations, the mainline church in America was a bastion of, of power. It was a place of influence on political life and culture. It, those were the churches that if you wanted to be somebody, you, you were a part of, but no more. And the Reverend Taylor says without missing a beat, yeah, I know about the decline. And the interviewer asks, well, what do you think about this loss of influence and power and status on American culture? And she said, maybe our churches can finally do some good. And you know, I can imagine Paul all these years later saying, you know, I think she's getting it. Friends, Christ crucified looks like foolishness to us always. It doesn't lead to personal happiness or comfort or your own gratification. Christ crucified is not a good death avoidance strategy. And Paul says, I know. Friends, 
when he tells his story, we see that Paul was ambitious, he was successful, he was going places before he met Jesus. And as Paul says, I was at the beginning of the parade, and now I am the garbage of the world. And if you want to know glory and power and freedom and success the way that God defines it, come join me at the end of the line among the slaves, the anonymous, the forgotten, and the useless garbage of the world. We want to follow the successful leader. The trouble is, Paul says, the successful leader is at the back of the procession in chains. Not because suffering is good by itself. It's because in a world of self-glorification where everyone wants to be the leader, the end of the line is where you find Jesus. Jesus, who was a man of no reputation, it should be obvious, but apparently sometimes we forget. We have four detailed accounts of Jesus' life and his words, and you know that not one of them ever mentions anything about what he looked like. We don't know anything about the sound of his voice or how tall he was or how much money he had. In fact, by all accounts, Jesus should not be remembered at all. He spent his first 30 years of his life in obscurity in a small town that nobody even knew how to find on a map. He picked incompetent friends who couldn't remember what he said five minutes ago, much less uh, spin it. <laughs> Jesus dies this horrific death. He leaves no writings at all. He builds no buildings and puts his name on none of them. He does not run for office, and yet, as Dallas Willard once wrote, Jesus stands quietly at the center of the contemporary world as he himself predicted. Why? Because in a world of false selves and shiny fake images, the thing about Jesus that sets him apart is that the man is the message. Jesus is the message. He is the same all the way down. And so he is the only one in whom it is safe to put our faith. For he alone is who he says he is. He alone does what he says that he is going to do. And he says, I have sheep. I know them by name. I call them by name, which is an identity statement. And Jesus says, if you want to know life, then give up everything that you have and are and aspire to be and everything that you were doing to make a name for yourself. And I will give you a name and you will have life. Because, of course, the paradox of Christianity is that Jesus, who seemed like nobody special, was actually everything. Jesus is the only one who has ever really had any reputation at all. And it was... <laughs> His reputation was that he was beloved of God. He was the one who was worthy of all glory and praise, and he gave all of that up so that he could come here and so that he could give it to you, which is what he does on the cross, which is foolish to the self-glorifying and life itself to those who have no claim and no title in themselves. You know who Carl Lentz is? Have you heard that name? Carl Lentz was a famously attractive, charismatic preacher in New York City. He was the lead pastor of Hillsong, New York. He was Justin Bieber's pastor. And after the news came out that Carl Lentz had had an affair and that the church was wrapped up in this cult of personality and had become celebrity idolatrous, it was Justin Bieber of all people. I know this sounds crazy, but Justin Bieber is the one who in, the, who in interview sounds like the spiritually grounded man in the world. He's doing an interview with GQ magazine, okay? <laughs> and Justin Bieber says this. He says, I think church can be surrounded around the pastor. And it's like this guy has the ultimate relationship with God that we all want, but we can't get because we're not this guy. That's not the reality, though. The reality is every human being has the same access to God. Or, as Paul put it, don't you know, my friends, that you yourselves 
are the place where God dwells? Don't you know that God's Spirit dwells among you? Don't you know that you don't need to boast about leaders to get access to God because God has given those leaders to you? You to the leaders and everything is yours because they are Christ's and Christ's is God and so are you. Christ is yours and so is his reputation. And so, my friends, you are free not to matter. You are free to gather for worship amongst ordinary people. For here, you already have all of the glory that God could possibly give you, which is himself among you, which is, after all, the purpose of church in the first place. My friends, what we do here. We're not doing this to, to prove that Christianity is cool or credible or naturally attractive. We are here, we exist to make people into little Christs. And God does his best work one unremarkable, unposted, unnoticed moment at a time. Sometimes he might even use a pastor. So last year at a classes meeting, a regional group of church leaders in our church, uh, I was asked to examine a new pastoral candidate, and one of the questions that I asked him was this, who in your life has been a model of what it means to be a pastor? Who in your life has been a model of what it means to be a pastor? And Joel was his name, not your Joel, another one. He thought for a moment and then he, he told me a story about a Reformed Baptist pastor in his mid-60s whom none of us have never heard of before. His name was Joe, and he preached at exegetically, and he smoked a pipe, and he had calluses on his hands. Joel, at the time, was not a ministry person. Uh, he was a construction worker, and he had a dear friend named Jeremiah who died two weeks after his wedding. They had been working together, renovating a very old post and beam barn, working long days, and Jeremiah was driving an hour to work each day. And the last time that Joel saw him, he wrote Jeremiah a paycheck for his work, and he watched him drive away up over the hill. Half an hour later, Jeremiah fell asleep at the wheel, and the check was never cashed. The next day, when Joel came to work and heard the news, everything seemed blurry to him. He'd heard the night before, but somehow he couldn't believe it. He says, well, maybe they got the name wrong. Maybe this was just a dream. Everything looks better in the morning, right? So Joel drives to the work site, and he's watching the sun come up, and he's, he's looking at that hillside where he'd last seen Jeremiah's taillights disappear. And he says, and then I heard a vehicle. And I listened as it came up over the hill, but instead of Jeremiah, it was Pastor Joe. And he drove down toward me in his old Ford truck, and he parked the car. He was not in a hurry, but he moved with a purpose. Without a word, he just grabbed me and hugged me. Not a one-armed handshake hug, a, a bear hug. And I cried, and he cried too. And when he finally spoke, it was only to recite the first half of Psalm 139. And he stayed with me for the rest of the morning until he convinced me that I should go home and spend this time with my family. I don't know how he knew where to find me. I don't know how he heard in the first place. But what struck me about this day was that Joe was just there present with a humble authority. I will never forget God's providence that day in sending this man to find me. Do you know what strikes me about that story? It did not take a seminary degree to do that. There wasn't anything special about Joe in that story at all. Why any of us could be Joe. Showing up 
embracing a sister or a brother in the strange or weak or foolish moments of our lives, moments where we are doing something very ordinary and seemingly foolish like entering someone else's pain and weakness at the bottom of a hill in the depths of despair in the prison or the hospital and finding together that God is very, very strong. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Friends, would you pray with me?